Well, hello, everybody. How are you? You glad to be in church? So marginally feeling okay about being here. Are you glad to be in church? There it is. Can we, let's just have a good time together. We just spend time in the presence of God, and I, I think that's cause for celebration. So uh, I'm just, uh, I'm grateful to be here, excited to be with you. Um, and so before we get into the message, let me just touch on a couple of things. First, uh, we rescheduled our family fun and fireworks for this Friday. How do you like all of those Fs in there? Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, so we're, we're excited about that. But here's the thing. Uh, the closer we get to it, the worse the weather looks. And uh, I just want to be really clear. Um, I know uh, that we serve the God who can silence the wind and the waves. And so I think there's a real possibility that we could have that. But just be on the lookout for us. Just any communication that we have. We get closer in the week. We're going to have to make some decisions uh, around that. But we're excited about that event. Going to be a lot of fun, but, but just to have that on your radar. Um, something really cool kind of happened this week, and I want to connect you to it um, and just, just let you know. Uh, um, for years now, we have been connected in doing outreach ministry and um, taking mission trips down to the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. Uh, and we've made some good relational connections, and there's a plan actually for us to do a trip this year. Uh, and I want to put that on your radar because in a couple of weeks, we're going to have an interest meeting for those of you who may want to be connected to going down and helping serve. Um, but as a part of that trip, Michelle and a couple of ladies in our church went down to sort of um, go down and assess what are some of the things that uh, we need to do to um, how, how, who do we need to get connected with? Who is it that we can best serve? We want to make sure that uh, we're not just going down there for us, but we're going down there in a way that we can really serve people. And as a part of that, we, we realize that there's a lot of need in the schools. And as uh, Michelle was going through the school, she ran into a principal that told her a story of some of the students that were in the school down there. Um, they have an unbelievable need in a lot of these schools. In fact, many of the families are struggling just to put food on the table. So um, the, this school in particular, though, received a grant, and that grant was for robotics. Uh, they didn't really know what they were going to do with it, but they sort of found a teacher and formed a robotics team and, and got together, and these kids turned out to be brilliant at this, so much so that they qualified for state. And then they went and they won state, which... <laughs> which then qualified them to go to the world championships in Dallas. Pretty cool, right? The problem is, is that these families didn't have the funds necessary to be able to get themselves to Dallas to participate in the world championships. They've been trying to do fundraisers and that kind of thing, and then Michelle walked into the school and made this connection, and she came back and told me, and I said, you know what? We got a church full of generous people. Uh, and, and so what you have to even recognize and understand is that for many of these kids that are on this robotics team, for them to go to Worlds will be the first time that they have even ever left Oklahoma. For many of them, going to state was the first time they had ever walked off the property of the Cherokee Nation. So this is a huge opportunity for them. And so uh, I want to show you just a news clip about these special kids, and then Michelle and I got to hop onto a Zoom this week with these kids and let them know that as a church, we're going to help them get to Worlds. Uh, and so uh, bearing in mind, this was early in the morning, high school students on a Zoom. So the quality, you have to lean in for the quality <laughs> and the excitement, um, but take a look at this team from a small Oklahoma school district is heading to a world championship. Yeah, the team will go against robot builders from around the world at the VEX Robotics World Championship next month. News on 6's Mackenzie Gladney has the details from Delaware County. I'm here at a Kenwood Public Schools with the robotics team. They're getting ready for the VEX Robotics World Championship next month. Meet Blake, Josiah, Aaron, and Grayson, who are headed to Dallas, Texas. It's an unlikely journey because at the beginning of the school year, they didn't even have a robotics team. That changed when their new teacher, Mr. Mays, stepped in. He found our old robotics stuff and was asking us if we did robotics. And which we told him. Hi, boys. Hello. Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning. Hey. 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 Hey.
How are you? <laughs> it's early morning, right? Uh, we're, we're Greg and Michelle Hartman, and we're, we're pastors of Vineyard Church in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, what we heard is that, like, this is the go-to team for robotics. Is that, is that the truth? <laughs> we heard you guys are pretty talented. Yeah, we heard you guys are awesome. Enough that you've made it, you've you uh, got all the way to where you've qualified to go to Worlds. Is that right? Yeah. That's pretty awesome. And you guys have been trying to raise money to be able to to be able to get down to Dallas and, and be able to go to Worlds? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, we have a church that is full of people that likes to, to help people. And so we wanted to get on with you guys today and let you know um, that we are going to give you the rest of the money that you need to go to Worlds. Thank you. <laughs> you are so welcome. We're going to make sure that you can get down there and compete and uh, have the best time. And, uh, and if your parents and teachers will let us, we'll give you some extra money to like go to Six Flags or something too. <laughs> You're so welcome. Well, we believe in you guys, and we want you guys to have a great time, and you've worked hard for this, and so just want you to know that there's a lot of people behind you, and just go and have fun, and do the best you can in the competition, and we believe in you guys. Congratulations, guys, on making it to Worlds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dean Boyd, this wasn't an accident that we've made this far. It's something very special. It's really designed about it. Yeah. Yeah. We we think so too, and so we're we're just so privileged to be able to to partner with you and and excited to excited to see what you can do. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank well, we we can't wait to hear how you do. We'll talk to you later. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye, guys. You too. Isn't that fun? So we're just excited to, to be able to partner with them and, and to be able to send them down there and to be able to compete. Just an opportunity that they would not get if somebody didn't intervene. And so we're just so grateful and privileged that we get to be the ones to partner with them. And, and the truth is, is what I said in that video is the truth, that we have a church full of people that like to help people. Uh, and so I'm grateful. I'm grateful for your obedience and for your generosity, um, that you're faithful to give. Um, because when we hear about situations and needs like that, we're able to say yes immediately uh, and know that the heart of our people is generous because we love people. Um, and so we'll put the ways that you can give up on the screens. Um, we've got kiosks in the back of the room if you came prepared to give in person today. But I, I really am uh, I was just so touched to be a part of that and know that for and Michelle and I being on that call, we're simply representatives of this entire body um, reaching out and connecting with those people. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do. All right. Are you ready to get into the Word today? Let's do it. Uh, we're in a series right now that we're calling Christianese, just a little uh, mini-series. We're going to probably wedge these in throughout the year if we've got some time between messages and, and things like that. But really what I'm trying to do with this is to tackle some of terminology that is connected around our faith and Christianity, some stuff maybe even that we say uh, that we don't know why we say it, or it's just tradition that we say it, or, or things that, that maybe we maybe kind of have a grasp on, but we don't fully understand, but, but we kind of use them in Christian terms and vernacular, but, um, but do we really have the context for what they are? Let me just, this isn't what I'm going to talk about tonight, but let me just give you uh, an example. Um, have you ever gotten together with a group of people and you're praying protection over somebody and you go, Lord, would you just put a hedge of protection around them? It's Christian terminology, and I will tell you, that is in the Bible. But do you know who you're quoting when you say hedge of protection? If you have Satan on your bingo card, 
That is the only individual in Scripture who says the terminology hedge of protection. Now, it's not a bad context. It's around Job because God says, have you tried my servant Job? And Satan says, well, doesn't he have a hedge of protection around him? It's the only time it's used in Scripture. Did you know that? Probably not, but you throw hedge of protection out there quite a bit. (laughs) That's Christianese. So I want to kind of tackle another thing that we find in Scripture today. And so today, I want to talk about what it means to bear fruit. Uh, Some of you may have no context for this, and you're like, a bear and fruit. I don't know what is going on, but the terminology bear fruit is not even expressly a Christian one. To bear fruit literally means to yield positive results. It's honestly just kind of a farming term, meaning that the effort that you've made in planting caring for and cultivating a plant or crop is now, sh- and is now at a place where the fruit begins to show itself. And we can understand that metaphorically, uh, as Christians, when we say that, this is in reference to our lives. As Christians, we can't take it literally. We can't believe that at some point, because of our faith, that fruit is just going to begin to grow off of our bodies to where we are bearing fruit. So in our Christian context, what fruit should we be looking for, for to show up in our lives that we would then bear fruit? Well, in our context, we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. So go with me to Galatians 5, verse 22, and this lays out those fruits of the Spirit. It says this, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, desires, and the way that we would really like to live. Now, I want to reiterate that. It's a list of our greatest desires and really the way that we'd like to live. But I don't know that we wrap our heads around that a lot of times because as I'm listing these things, in your heart you may not say, oh, but those are my greatest desires. But I would challenge you and say, no, I bet that they really are. Because at the root of even what your desires are, are these things. If you were really to take a a microscope to the desires of your heart and say, these are the things that I'm pursuing in life, at the end of the day, what you're really looking for are these things. Let me put it to you this way. When you say, well, you know what I'm really looking for, the desire of my heart, what I spend my bandwidth and my time and my thought life on is relationships. You know, I'd really like to have a dear friend. I'd really like to to have a relationship. It would be great to have a boyfriend. It would be awesome if I could find a husband. If If I could just get those things, then it would really feel like my life was together. That's the desire of my heart. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. What you're really looking for is love. The, at the, the bottom desire of all of that is love. And you might say, well, that's not my desire. I'm, I'm, I'm in a relationship. I've got friends. But you know what? I really, the desire of my heart is really for my business to succeed. It's really for me to get to a place where I feel like I, I've made it and I can live comfortably. And, and I would then challenge you and say, well, aren't you then just looking for peace? Just to a place where life feels comfortable? Or, or maybe you're just in a season where you would say, you know what, I I just, uh, like there's just so much that is happening in my life and I feel like if I could just get over these circumstances, I could finally be happy. And so maybe your desire, the thing that's driving you is just to get through your circumstances and I would just challenge you and say, well then aren't you really just hoping for joy? So as you journey through these things and, and what we start to understand is that we find ourselves in this place where we're either desperate for relationship or We're trying to succeed in some way, and if we pursue those things and we continue to see destruction around ourselves, how often is it because we failed to have patience? Or we bulldoze through life trying to achieve, and we're leaving a wake behind us, and there's nothing in our life that resembles gentleness or self-control. And the truth is, is that the behavior that we exhibit on the way to our desires And the lack of feeling that we have those things in our desires are symptomatic of the same thing. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives. In fact, if we go a little backwards in Galatians, 
Paul is writing here telling us that the Holy Spirit is the thing that guides how our lives should go. Why? Because if we just pursue what we want, we find ourselves in dark places where there is conflict. There's conflict in our lives and conflicts in us, and we don't know what to do. And so Paul says, let me break this down for you. Let the Holy Spirit be the thing that drives your life. And then he lays out for us, if we don't, this is what life is going to look like. He says this, Galatians 5.16, we're backing up in Scripture a little bit. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what our sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting with each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you're directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Look, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, and wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a pretty clear list. And, and do you know what I find, like, just so apparent? That these things are so ingrained into everything that we see in the world right now. Division and dissension. Immorality and impurity. Lust drives people forward. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy. It seems as though in every nook and cranny of our culture, it is easy to find those things. And here's what it's saying. If you let yourself be driven by these things instead of the Holy Spirit, this is the result. But he doesn't leave it there. He goes on and says, but when the Holy Spirit is at work and guiding your life, then what you really desire can be seen in your life. So let's go back and revisit the fruits of the Spirit verse again, but I really want you to pay close attention to the terminology. So he, he lays this all out. Look, when you're, when you're just led in your life by what you feel that you desire, here's the result. But when you allow the Holy Spirit into your life, here is what you're going to find. This is the fruit of that in your life. But look at the terminology, Galatians 5.22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. I want you to see this. The Holy Spirit produces these fruits. And so we call them fruits of the Spirit. Have you ever thought about this like in real practicality? Like we say that a lot, right? Like the fruits, oh, well, the fruits of the Spirit. But have you ever thought like fruit? <laughs> Like, in all of the vernacular and all of the metaphor that could be used, the, the terminology fruit is what comes out. So if I, if I can just go back with you for a minute to, like, fourth grade science, and you started learning about plants, are we all on the same page here a little bit? Okay. You started learning about plants and the elements needed in order for you to grow a plant that would... And, and maybe you like took a bean and you put it in a wet paper towel and you see if it would sprout. Okay, well, I am the only one to do that, all right. <laughs> but you would do like experiments to see if anything could grow. 
And, and, and then you, your teacher would say, well, hey, they, hey, here's the things, you know, in order for you to see the things grow, like if you want to grow something that would then yield some sort of a, a fruit or a product, here's what you need. And here's the elements needed, seed, soil, nutrients, water, and light. And so this verse, with very intentional language, the Apostle Paul is speaking, says, the Holy Spirit produces fruit in our lives. Here's what Paul is saying, that the Holy Spirit is a seed that gets planted. The Holy Spirit is a seed that gets planted planted. So if that is the case, and the Apostle Paul is saying to us that you can have this sort of fruit in your lives, then what does that make us? The soil. So I want you to look at this. He's saying that the Holy Spirit is a seed that gets planted into you that is the soil of your life. Now, what does that look like? If only somebody had told us what it was like to be soil. Wouldn't you know it? <laughs> that laid out in the Gospels, Jesus just happens to tell a parable in order to illustrate for people and give people some understanding. Jesus did this often. He would tell stories that were metaphorical in nature so that he could help people understand. And as he would go into places like farming communities, he would tell farming stories so that people could grasp the concept. And so in Luke, the eighth chapter, Jesus tells this story, and they, we call it the parable of the sower. And I would say that it would easily be able to be called the parable of the soils. Because it says this, Luke 8, verse 4, One day Jesus told the story in the form of a parable to a large crowd that had gathered from many towns near him. A farmer went out to plant his seed, and as he scattered it across the field, some fell on a footpath where it was stepped on and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among the rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that had grown up and it choked out the tender plants. Still, other seed fell on fertile soil, and this seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much had been planted. And when he said this, he called out, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Now, I, I don't think that when you hear that story, it should be hard to draw the conclusion that Jesus is trying to get us to understand here. So let me just put it plainly, be good soil. When you are fertile soil, it produces a crop a hundred times what has been planted. That means that your life flourishes. And I think that's what we want to feel, isn't it? Like our lives are flourishing. Because, because I, like if, we're, if we're real for a moment and if we would let down our facades and the filters that we put on our photos for just a moment, they would say there's an outcry probably in the hearts of us that feel like really life just feels like a struggle. And the idea that life could flourish seems so foreign to us that I don't even know that we could process what that really looks like. Jesus is saying, look, to in order for you to find that in your life, in order for you to find that place that you're living, you have to be good soil. Good soil is required. But this is the greatness of Jesus, because he doesn't just leave it in sort of like a, so figure out what that means. He pulls the disciples aside and he goes, look, I'm going to tell you <laughs> what this means, and he lays it out. He says, let me tell you what I mean. So in Luke 8, verse 11, he says, this is the meaning of the parable. parable. The seed is God's word. Now, there's a couple of things here. The word of God has a couple of understandings. The scripture, this, this Bible that we read, is the word of God. But the gospel of John also references Jesus as the word of God. 
And as we've been talking about here, Paul is referring to the Holy Spirit as the seed that is planted in our life. So here's the conclusion that we can draw in all of this. We need God in us. We need him with us. We need him to make his residence in us. We need our lives to be his dwelling place. We need to have a willingness to say, come and make your presence known in me. Walk with me and be with me, not momentarily and not just in instances, but make your residence inside of me. Be with me. Now, secondly, can I, can I make it just a quick confession to you? Because like I went to Sunday school and I learned these, I heard all of these parables. And so I just got to tell you the perspective that I had in my life for a really long time. Because I would read a sower went out to sow his seed and it fell on four different types of soil. And in my heart, what I would do is be like, that's right. I'm trying to go out with the life and I want to share the gospel with people. And sometimes you run into people and they're like hard, rocky soil. And sometimes you run into people and they're like thorny soil. And man, that's a shame for them. And I just never was introspective enough to ask myself, what kind of soil am I? What, what kind of soil am I? What fruit am I seeing in my lives? And, and so when we read this, it's saying we know what the seed is. It's the presence of God coming into our lives. But I think that we have to challenge ourselves and ask, what kind of soil am I? And then Jesus lays it out for us in a way that we can understand the representations of what he's saying. Verse 12, the seeds that fell on the put, footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. This is telling us that we can be a soil that never lets the seed get planted in our lives. We can hear who God is. We can, we can get some, some rumors about who he can be in our life, but when we hear it, it just lands on the surface of who we are and it never gets planted. God can never root himself into our lives and because we never allow it to get rooted, it can be taken from us. When circumstances come, when hard, hard times come, we can find ourselves in a place where all we ever did was we just heard about him and we never allowed ourselves to experience him. That's soil number one. In verse 13, it says, the seeds on rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while and then they fall away when they face temptation. So this is us connecting in relationship with God, but the minute we face difficulty, the minute that we allow the things that we face in our life to become the lens through which we view everything and we neglect what God is doing in us, then we don't get to see the fruit. The minute that, that times are difficult, instead of saying, I've got this residence of God in me, then all we can focus on is the problem. And it robs us of what God can do in our lives because we stop looking at him and we start looking at circumstances. So Jesus is saying, like, don't be that soil. Don't let it fall on the hard ground. Let it get planted. Don't, don't let it temporarily be there with shallow roots. Verse 14, the seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by, look, by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life, so they never grow in maturity. So here we see being a soil that allows everything else to grow in our lives, that it chokes out what God is trying to do in us. We want a little bit of God in our lives. Well, we go, yeah, look, I want God to be planted in my life, um, but also lots of other stuff too. And when we, we look out and we survey our lives, it's almost as though we think that if God is the thing that is planted in the center of our life, it's not enough. And so we want to plant everything else. And the eventuality is that those pursuits and the things that we try and achieve with our lives make God secondary in our pursuits. 
And the maturity that we can receive in relationship with him just never makes it to that place. And in fact, it overtakes what God is trying to do with us. And then lastly, verse 15, and the seeds that fell on good soil represent good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. Now, I want you to, to, to see that because he's saying there's some patience that's wrapped up in there. There's some holding on that's wrapped up in there. But I also want you to see that the harvest is huge. Cling to what God is doing in your life. Trust and believe that it will produce fruit and that you truly want to see it in your life, and then your life can be filled with love and with peace and with joy. You can be kind, and you can be patient. I want to open my life and allow God to take residence in me to grow deep roots and to see the fruit of His Spirit in my life. And I want to be clear for a moment. Growing things and seeing fruit yielded is work. Not his presence. Because I, I want you to look at, at the beginning of this parable when Jesus comes out. He, he says the sower comes out and he just starts throwing out seed. So it's not, the, it's not God's presence. It's not God's desire to connect with you. It's not him saying, I'm withholding myself from you. No, it's the opposite. I am freely scattering this seed. Now what is determined on the fruit that grows is how you deal with it. God is not inaccessible. He's not saying, because you're not being good soil, I won't give my presence to you. He's saying, no, look, my presence is for you. I'm going to give it to you now. What will you do with it? How will you handle it? See, if we want fruit in our lives, it takes attention and it takes effort. We have to tend to it. Look, when Jesus picked a metaphor to talk about these things growing in our lives, he did an infomercial for it and just be like, set it and forget it. <laughs> he was like, no, look, uh, you know what it is? A, a, a metaphor? Farming. Let me tell you about me. I have whatever the opposite of a green thumb is, is what I've got. A dead thumb. If that's a thing, that's what I've got. And so much of it is because I just feel like in my life, I don't have the time that it takes to cultivate something healthy. So I, I can go out and I can plant it and I'll be like, I mean, I guess let it rain because I'm probably not coming back to this thing for a couple of weeks. And is that not what we do? Like, I would really just love to see some fruit of these things in my life. So on occasion when I can get there, I'll try and get to church. Oh, I'd really love to see God do something in my life, but uh, I'll pray before a meal sometimes. See, I think that we have the desire to see God at work. We have the desire to see his fruit evident in our lives, but are you tending to and caring for what the presence of God is doing in your life? Do you care enough for it, that you tend to it, that you lean into it, that you have expectation for it, that when you see other things that are starting to take its place, that you get on your knees and you weed out what needs to be weeded out? Do you have the diligence and the effort because our desires will be reflected in the effort that we give to tend to our spiritual lives? to dedicate time to him, to be faithful to him, to long for his voice and to listen to it. But I, I want to I finish, though, by, by going back to fourth grade science. Because I, here, here is God saying, look, I, I want to give you my presence. I want it to be a seed that can be planted in your life. And I want you to be good soil cling to what I'm doing and hold on to it. And so in this, we have the seed and the soil. 
But, but you know, the list that we have for things that need to grow is a little bit longer than seed and soil because we've got nutrients and water and light in order for these things to really grow in our lives. And the Spirit of God can be planted in your life and the fruits of the Spirit that you're desperate for can flourish. But once that seed is planted, we have to help it grow. And while we talk about God and His Word and the Spirit and the seed being in us, what about the nutrients and the water and the light? Well, I want you to look at some other words from Jesus and who He calls Himself. See, when we look at nutrients, this is what Jesus says in John 6, 51. He says, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven, and anyone who eats this bread will live forever, and this bread which I offer so, so the world may live is my flesh. You need nutrients. You need food. It's me. Anyone who eats it will have life forever. Well, what about Water. Say, so in order for these things to grow in our life, we, we need water. So what does Jesus say about himself? Well, in John 4, verse 13, Jesus says this. Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give them will never be thirsty again. It comes from fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Nutrients and water. What about the light? In John 8, 12, Jesus says this. Jesus spoke once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you don't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. All the components to have the fruit of the Spirit can exist within this paradigm. The presence of God, which he freely gives to us. And if we can cultivate and make ourselves good soil and say, I will receive your spirit and I want to cultivate it and I want to grow it and I want to put effort into it and I want it to be a priority in my life. I want to put you first. But then Jesus says, look, in all of these things, I'm here for you. I want to help it grow. So what's the key? Well, staying connected to Jesus is the key. Let me put this as plainly as I can. We need Jesus. So can the cry of our hearts be, cultivate my life to be good soil? I open up my presence to take, for you to take residence in my life. And then can we realize our continual need for Jesus? to see that fruit grow in our lives. Because I, I don't know about you, but in the tumultuous world that we live in, where it seems as though discord and argument are the norm, where, where life is difficult because all of these pressures bombard us, I can tell you that love and joy and peace are things that I desire so greatly in my life. And when I read Scripture, what a profound thing it is to see that it's available for me. And that it's not hidden. He wants to give it to me. He desires for it to yield in my life, and what he gives me can grow in abundance a hundred times more. My life can flourish. I can find joy, and I can walk in patience, and, and when I get into a conversation, I can look at people with kindness, and I can be good. I won't find myself quarrelsome and angry, and frustrated, desiring things that only pull me backwards. No, because of who he is and him freely giving his spirit, I can find myself in a place where I'm overwhelmed with the goodness of who he is, and it's coming off of my life, bearing fruit in my life. And so I just got to tell you, I'm going to keep running back to Jesus. 
I'm going to keep going and saying, I need more of you. Like, help me be who I need to be. I need your light, and I need that water, and I need that bread. Keep helping this stuff grow in my life. I want to tend to the soil. I want to find myself in prayer. I want to find myself in your presence. I want to find myself in your word. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. And not just because of what you can do for me, but because of who you are in your presence, I find all that I need. We need Jesus in a broken, shattered world. We need Jesus in a lost, angry, divisive world. We need Jesus in a love starved world. We need Jesus in a confused world. We need Jesus. I've been talking to, let's call them senior saints. over the past few weeks, and I'm just saying, like, from my perspective, I think that the world needs Jesus more than ever before. And without fail, every one of them has looked at me and said, I could not agree more. I don't even know where we're living anymore. We need Jesus. I need Jesus. You need Jesus. I want to see that fruit in my life, and my prayer is that you would want to see it too. I want to bear the fruit of his spirit in my life. And so I'll do the work that I need to do, but I recognize that I need all of the elements to see it grow, and so I'll keep going back to Jesus. Can that be our prayer tonight? Can that be our prayer? Can we open up our lives? We need more of you. Can we pray that together? God, I... I know that for many of us, we find ourselves in broken places. And we've been on the pursuit of things that we hope would bring us to a place that we could see these things that we desire so greatly in our life. We want love and we need joy. We can't seem to find peace. There is no patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness. Self-control is, is hard to come by. And so there's a recognition in our lives, that there has to be something outside of ourselves that can help us find it. And what we see in your word is that the answer is you. And so, God, could we have the diligence to hold on to be good soil? And as you pour your presence out on us and we experience the goodness of who you are, could we recognize that we need you and would it not be enough for us to just in isolated moments be in your presence, but would we recognize, Jesus, that we need you every day? And so would we run to you? And would we call on you? And would we hope in you? And would we listen for you? And would you meet us? And bring us to a place that though the world is dark, and though there are things that we can't understand, Lord, your word says that you give us unexplainable peace and a love that overcomes all things. So would our lives flourish in your presence as we seek you in our lives. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give you just a moment of reflection Maybe it's just a moment for you to say, I need you, Jesus. Maybe you've been neglectful in tending to the soil, and this is just a moment to say, I'm going to put my eyes, I'm going to refocus my heart back on him. And, and I'll just tell you, you'd say, like, I don't even know how to do that. I don't know how to pray. Can I tell you? It's as simple as this. I need you, Jesus. If you don't know what to pray and you don't know how to pray it, can I just challenge you in this next, next reflective moment to just say that? in your heart, I need you, Jesus. And believe me when I tell you that he will meet you. Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask our prayer teams to come forward and to be available if you're walking through something and you want somebody to partner with you in prayer. These people are up here and available to partner with you and to pray with you and to walk with you through situations that you're going through. I um, really just believe that God can meet you in this situation. I'm going to step off for a moment. I'll come back and close with a blessing.
but would you lean into this moment? Would you lean into his presence and would you just let him know right now that you need him?